Anopheles mosquitoes transmit malaria parasites of the genus Plasmodium. Screening these mosquitoes for parasite proteins that are present in the infective stage of the parasite life cycle is a malaria surveillance tool that can be used to estimate sporozoite rates and entomological inoculation rates. The circumsporozoite enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or the CS ELISA, is a laboratory method that was developed to detect Plasmodium falciparum and P. vivax variants, VK210 and VK247. For the purpose of the CS ELISA, these will be referred to as PF, PV210, and PV247, respectively. The CS ELISA is used to detect circumsporozoite protein in the head thorax region of malaria-infected mosquitoes using sensitive and specific monoclonal antibodies. The CS ELISA was developed as a sandwich ELISA. Antisporozoite antibodies, or capture antibody, is adsorbed to the wells of an assay plate. Homogenate from the ground mosquitoes is added to the wells. Antisporozoite antibodies, or detection antibody, is added to the wells. ABTS substrate is added to the wells. If CS antigen is present, a color change occurs. Kits of CS ELISA antibodies and positive controls can be requested free of charge. The source and amount of antibodies and positive controls distributed in the kits is subject to change. It is important to use the protocol version enclosed with the kit and to be aware of the lot numbers on each vial. All other equipment, supplies, and reagents used in the CS ELISAs are available from commercial sources. More information on how to obtain antibody kits and examples of other equipment, supplies, and reagents are available in the CS ELISA manual. This instructional video is intended to accompany the CS ELISA manual. It is to be used as a resource for learning how to prepare the reagents for the CS ELISA and how to carry out the CS ELISA. The accompanying CS ELISA manual should be fully reviewed for important information before beginning the CS ELISA testing. For technical advice, comments, or recommendations regarding the CS ELISA, see the contact information in the CS ELISA manual. Personal protective equipment, abbreviated PPE, should be worn while preparing the CS ELISA reagents and conducting the CS ELISA. PPE should meet the regulations of the laboratory in which the work is being performed. This can include, but is not limited to, safety glasses, a lab coat, laboratory gloves, and closed-toed shoes. The following video will demonstrate how to prepare reagents and samples for the CS ELISA. There are many different types of equipment, supplies, and reagents that can be substituted for those that will be shown. When an item cannot be substituted for an alternative, this will be indicated. In these instances, using an alternative may lead to inaccurate CS ELISA results. Catalog and vendor information for suggested equipment, supplies, and reagents can be found in the CS ELISA manual. Using phenol red in CS ELISA solutions is optional. It is added to blocking buffer and 1x PBS to aid in visualizing those solutions on the assay plate. Addition of phenol red to these solutions is very helpful, particularly when learning the CS ELISA, so it should be used if available. The phenol red powder and concentrated solution will stain clothes and pipettes, so care should be taken when handling them. The materials needed for preparing 10 milliliters of phenol red solution are deionized water, a serological pipette, and serological pipette filler, for accurately measuring 10 milliliters of deionized water. Phenol red powder, a small weigh dish, scupula, and laboratory scale for accurately weighing one gram of phenol red powder. A 50 milliliter conical tube and conical tube holder for mixing the stock solution. 10 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tubes. A 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube tray a P1000 pipette, and P1000 pipette tips to create aliquots of the stock solution, a container to discard laboratory waste, 
an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. It is optional to use a vortex for mixing the solution. It is also optional to use a centrifuge that is able to fit the conical tube in order to collect the stock solution at the bottom of the tube. Centrifuging will also eliminate any bubbles that may stain the pipette shaft while preparing aliquots. Place the conical tube in a conical tube holder. Loosen the cap. Using a scupula, weigh one gram of phenol red into a small weigh dish. Remove the cap from the conical tube. Carefully transfer the phenol red into the conical tube. Using a serological pipette, and serological pipette filler. Measure and add 10 milliliters of deionized water to the phenol red in the conical tube. Discard the used serological pipette into a discard container. Cap the conical tube. Vortex it at medium to high speed or invert the tube until the phenol red is dissolved. If a centrifuge is available, the conical tube can be briefly centrifuged to eliminate bubbles and collect the phenol red solution at the bottom of the tube. Set a P1000 pipette to 1000 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Using the pipette, prepare 1 milliliter aliquots of phenol red solution in 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tubes. The pipette tip can be reused during the aliquotting step. Label each tube using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. It is recommended that pre-formulated phosphate buffered saline, or PBS, be purchased for the use in the CS ELISA. PBS is commonly available in many forms and concentrations, such as liquid, powder, and pre-weighed tablets. In the CS ELISA protocol, it is used at a 1x concentration. The procedure for preparing 1x PBS from concentrated 10x PBS liquid will be described. To prepare 1x PBS from powder or tablets, Follow the directions on the packaging. The addition of phenol red solution to 1x PBS is optional and recommended. Phenol red should only be added to 1x PBS that will be used to make working dilutions of capture antibody and PBS tween in the CS ELISA. 1x PBS that is used to make blocking buffer should not have phenol red added. It is recommended that 5 liters of 1x PBS with phenol red solution added be prepared and one liter of 1x PBS without phenol red solution be prepared at a time. 100 milligram per milliliter phenol red solution, if it is being added, should be prepared before the 1x PBS. For instructions on how to prepare the 100 milligram per milliliter phenol red solution, review the section Preparing Phenol Red Solution. The materials needed for preparing one liter of 1x PBS are deionized water, an empty sterilized one liter bottle, 10x PBS in liquid form, a small graduated cylinder for accurately measuring 100 milliliters of 10x PBS, a large graduated cylinder for accurately measuring 900 milliliters of deionized water, a P200 pipette and P200 pipette tips for adding phenol red solution if it is being used, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. Loosen the cap of the one liter bottle. Using the small graduated cylinder, measure 100 milliliters of 10X PBS. Remove the cap from the one liter bottle. 
Carefully pour the 10x PBS into the one liter bottle. Place the cap loosely over the bottle. Using the large graduated cylinder, measure 900 milliliters deionized water. Remove the cap from the one liter bottle. Carefully pour the deionized water into the one liter bottle containing 100 milliliters of 10x PBS. If phenol red solution is not being added, secure the cap onto the bottle and invert it 15 to 20 times to mix the solution and continue with the directions for labeling the bottle. If phenol red is being added, place the cap loosely over the bottle. Set the P200 pipette to 100 microliters. Using the pipette, measure 100 microliters of 100 milligram per milliliter phenol red solution. Remove the cap from the one liter bottle containing 1x PBS. Dispense the phenol red solution. Discard the pipette tip. Secure the cap onto the bottle and invert it 15 to 20 times to mix the 1x PBS with phenol red solution. Label the bottle using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the concentration, the date the solution was made, storage conditions, and the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the solution. PBS can be used immediately or can be stored at 4 degrees Celsius. 1x phosphate buffered saline containing 0.05% volume per volume tween 20, abbreviated PBS tween, is used as a wash buffer in the CS ELISA. PBS tween is commonly available in many forms and concentrations, such as liquid, powder, and pre-weighed tablets. The procedure for preparing PBS tween from 1x PBS and liquid tween 20 will be described. To prepare PBS tween from concentrated liquid, powder, or tablets, follow the directions on the packaging. 1x PBS with phenol red solution should be prepared before PBS tween. For instructions on how to prepare the 1x PBS with phenol red, Review the section, Preparing 1x PBS. It is recommended that three to four liters of PBS tween be prepared at a time. The materials needed for preparing one liter of PBS tween are one liter of 1x PBS with phenol red, tween 20, a P1000 pipette and P1000 pipette tips for measuring tween 20, scissors, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent under pad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. Loosen the cap of the one liter bottle containing 1x PBS. In the next step, tween 20 will be added. Tween 20 is highly viscous, so techniques for pipetting viscous liquids should be used. Low retention, wide bore pipette tips can be used, but if these are not available, clean scissors Scissors can be used to cut off about one millimeter of a normal pipette tip. This will widen the opening, making it easier to aspirate the tween 20. Set a P1000 pipette to 500 microliters and attach the pipette tip with the enlarged opening at the tip. A technique called reverse pipetting should be used for this step and can be used when pipetting any viscous liquids. Press the pipette plunger to the second stop before placing the tip into the tween 20. Holding the plunger at the second stop, put the pipette tip into the tween 20 just below the surface. Release the plunger very slowly, making sure the pipette tip remains submerged until liquid stops being drawn up into the pipette tip. If large bubbles of air are drawn into the pipette tip, Discard the pipette tip, place a new one on the pipette, and try again, releasing the plunger more slowly and leaving the pipette tip submerged in the liquid a little longer. Remove the pipette tip from the tween 20. Gently touch the pipette tip to the inside of the container to remove any excess tween 20 from the outside of the pipette tip. Remove the cap from the 1x PBS with phenol red. Move the pipette tip over the 1x PBS with phenol red. The pipette shaft should remain fully outside of the bottle. Slowly press the plunger to the first stop only. Hold the plunger at the first stop until tween 20 is no longer running out of the pipette tip. Do not press the plunger to the second stop. Discard the used pipette tip and any remaining tween 20 in the tip into a discard bin. Be careful that the tween 20 does not touch the base of the pipette shaft 
inside the pipette tip as it is being aspirated. If it appears as though this might happen, lower the volume setting of the pipette and repeat the reverse pipetting procedure with a new pipette tip each time until a total of 500 microliters has been added. Secure the cap onto the bottle and invert it 15 to 20 times to mix the PBS tween solution. Label the one liter bottle using a permanent, fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the concentration, the date the solution was made, storage conditions, and the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the solution. PBS tween can be used immediately or can be stored at 4 degrees Celsius. Blocking buffer should be made in a fume hood. There is potential for hazardous fumes to be created when boiling sodium hydroxide and adding concentrated sodium hydroxide to the solution. If it is not possible to use a fume hood, blocking buffer should be made in a well ventilated area. Additional personal protective equipment that can be worn includes, but is not limited to, an acid resistant smock and face shield. The casing used to make blocking buffer should be ordered from Sigma Aldrich, catalog number C7078. This item should not be substituted. The addition of phenol red solution to the blocking buffer is recommended but optional. It is added to aid in visualizing the blocking buffer and samples in the assay plate. It is very helpful, particularly when learning the CS ELISA. 100 milligram per milliliter phenol red solution and 1x PBS should be prepared before the blocking buffer is made. For instructions on how to prepare the 100 milligram per milliliter phenol red solution, review the section Preparing Phenol Red Solution. For instructions on how to prepare the 1x PBS, review the section Preparing 1x PBS. The concentration of the sodium hydroxide should be 0.1 normal. If needed, prepare or dilute stock sodium hydroxide to this concentration before proceeding. The materials needed for preparing one liter of blocking buffer are a sterilized one liter beaker, a sterilized magnetic stir bar and stirring hot plate for mixing the blocking buffer solution, casein, a weigh dish, scupula, and laboratory scale for accurately weighing five grams of casein, 1x PBS, a large graduated cylinder for accurately measuring 900 milliliters of 1x PBS, 0.1 normal sodium hydroxide, a small graduated cylinder for accurately measuring 100 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid, a P200 pipette and P200 pipette tips for adding phenol red, and small amounts of hydrochloric acid to neutralize the solution, a calibrated pH meter, 100 milligrams per milliliter of phenol red solution, heat resistant gloves for handling the beaker containing boiling liquid, a piece of aluminum foil to cover the beaker to minimize evaporation while boiling, four sterilized 250 milliliter containers to dispense aliquots of blocking buffer, deionized water, lab tissues, and pH storage buffer for rinsing and storing the pH meter probe, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent under pad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. The pH meter should be stored, calibrated, and operated according to the manufacturer's instructions. All materials needed for pH meter calibration and maintenance should also be on hand. The pH meter probe should be able to easily reach the surface of the blocking buffer solution in the beaker. This will allow for the pH to be monitored as the solution is being neutralized with hydrochloric acid. The size of the aliquots created should reflect the rate of blocking buffer use. Approximately 75 milliliters of blocking buffer is needed for each assay plate, including the volume required for preparing mosquitoes in grinding buffer. Buffer. Blocking buffer can be stored for one week or longer at 4 degrees Celsius. Weigh 5 grams of casein using a scale, scupula, and weigh dish. This step does not need to be done in the fume hood. The remainder of the protocol for preparing blocking buffer should be done in a setting with proper ventilation. Place the magnetic stir bar into the beaker. Measure 100 milliliters of 0.1 normal sodium hydroxide into the small graduated cylinder. Carefully pour 100 milliliters of 0.1 normal sodium hydroxide into the beaker. Cover the beaker with aluminum foil to minimize evaporation during heating. Place the covered beaker on the stirring hot plate. Turn the stirring on at low speed. Turn the heat to high. Bring the sodium hydroxide to a boil. It is critical that the sodium hydroxide is boiling before continuing. If the sodium hydroxide is not boiling, the casein may not fully mix into solution. 
Once the sodium hydroxide is boiling, turn the mixing up to a medium speed. If the sodium hydroxide is splashing in the beaker, reduce the stirring speed. Remove the aluminum foil. Slowly add the casein in small amounts. A scupula can be used to transfer the casein to prevent clumping in the whey dish. Allow time between additions for the casein to fully mix into solution. Once all of the casein has been added and is in solution, replace the aluminum foil on the beaker. There should be no clumps of casein visible. If casein is still visible, continue mixing. Turn off the heat, leave stirring on at a medium speed, allow the solution to cool to room temperature. The heat should remain off for the remainder of the procedure. Once the solution has cooled to room temperature, the 1x PBS can be added. Using the large graduated cylinder, measure 900 milliliters of 1x PBS. Remove the aluminum foil from the beaker. Slowly add 900 milliliters of PBS. The stirring setting should remain on at a medium speed for the remainder of the blocking buffer preparation. Place the pH meter probe into the solution. Position the probe to one side of the beaker. The sensor at the tip of the probe should be submerged just below the surface of the solution. The solution should be basic at this point in the procedure. The next steps will lower the pH of the solution to 7.4. Set a P200 pipette to 200 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Using the pipette, slowly add small volumes of hydrochloric acid to the solution. The same pipette tip can be used as long as it does not touch the blocking buffer solution or any surfaces. Avoid adding the hydrochloric acid directly into the pH meter probe. Monitor the pH during additions to make sure it does not drop below 7.4. Allow time for mixing between additions of hydrochloric acid acid. Continue adding hydrochloric acid until the pH of the solution reaches 7.4. Smaller volumes of hydrochloric acid should be added as the pH approaches 7.4. Lower the volume of the pipette tip between additions of hydrochloric acid as needed. Discard the used pipette tip into a discard container. Using a P200 pipette set to 200 microliters and a new pipette tip, add 200 microliters of 100 milligram per milliliter phenol red solution to the blocking buffer solution. Discard the used pipette tip and allow the solution to fully mix. If phenol red is not being added to the blocking buffer, skip this step. Turn off the stirring and remove the beaker from the stirring hot plate. The stirring hot plate will not be needed for the remainder of the procedure. Carefully dispense the blocking buffer into desired aliquot volumes. Here, we are dispensing 250 milliliter volumes into four containers. Be sure to leave some airspace at the top of the container to allow for expansion during freezing. Label each container using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the concentration, the date the solution was made, storage conditions, and the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the solution. Containers should be stored upright and placed in the freezer with the caps loosened. The blocking buffer will expand during freezing and may cause the container to crack if this is not done. Once the blocking buffer has fully frozen, tighten the caps. After blocking buffer is removed from the freezer, it can be stored at four degrees Celsius for one week or more. If phenol red was added, the blocking buffer will be yellow in color when it is frozen, and once thawed, it will be an orange-red color. Grinding buffer is used to prepare mosquitoes for testing. It contains blocking buffer and a non-denaturing detergent, Igapol CA630, for solubilizing membrane proteins. For the purpose of this demonstration, Igapol will refer to Igapol CA630. Blocking buffer should be prepared before the grinding buffer is made. For instructions on how to prepare Prepare blocking buffer, review the section Preparing Blocking Buffer. Frozen blocking buffer can be thawed in a refrigerator overnight before grinding buffer is to be prepared. The materials needed for preparing 25 milliliters of grinding buffer are blocking buffer, Igapol CA630, a 50 milliliter conical tube and conical tube holder for mixing the grinding buffer, a serological pipette, and serological pipette filler for accurately measuring 25 milliliters of blocking buffer, a P200 pipette and P200 pipette tips for accurately measuring 125 microliters of Igapol scissors, a container
container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. It is recommended, but optional, to use a vortex for mixing the solution. It is also optional to use a centrifuge that is able to accommodate the conical tube. Centrifuging will eliminate any bubbles that may get in the way of the pipette shaft while transferring grinding buffer to sample tubes during mosquito grinding. This volume should be sufficient for grinding one plate of mosquitoes and can be scaled up or down as needed. Place an empty conical tube in the conical tube holder. Loosen the cap. Using a serological pipette and serological pipette filler, measure and add 25 milliliters of blocking buffer. Remove the cap from the empty conical tube. Transfer the blocking buffer to the conical tube. Loosely place the cap on the conical tube and discard the used serological pipette into the discard container. In the next step, Igapol will be added. Igapol is highly viscous, so techniques for pipetting viscous liquids should be used. Low retention, wide bore pipette tips can be used, but if these are not available, clean scissors can be used to cut off about one millimeter of a normal pipette tip. This will widen the opening, making it easier to aspirate the Igapol. Set a P200 pipette to 125 microliters and attach the pipette tip with the enlarged opening at the tip. A technique called reverse pipetting should be used for this step and can be used when pipetting any viscous liquids. Press the pipette plunger to the second stop before placing the tip into the Igapol. Hold the plunger at the second stop. Put the pipette tip into the Igapol just below the surface. Release the plunger very slowly, making sure the pipette tip remains submerged until liquid stops being drawn up into the pipette tip. If large bubbles of air are drawn into the pipette tip, discard the pipette tip, place a new one on the pipette, and try again, releasing the plunger more slowly and leaving the pipette tip submerged in the liquid a little longer. Remove the pipette tip from the Igapol. Gently touch the pipette tip to the inside of the container to remove any excess Igapol from the outside of the pipette tip. Remove the cap from the conical tube with blocking buffer. Move the pipette tip over the blocking buffer. The pipette shaft should remain fully outside the tube. Slowly press the plunger to the first stop only. Hold the plunger at the first stop until Igapol is no longer running out of the pipette tip. Do not press the plunger to the second stop. Discard the used pipette tip and any remaining Igapol in the tip into a discard bin. Be careful that the Igapol does not touch the base of the pipette shaft inside the pipette tip as it is being aspirated. If it appears as though this might happen, lower the volume setting of the pipette and repeat the reverse pipetting procedure with a new pipette tip each time until a total of 125 microliters has been added. Cap the conical tube. Vortex it at medium to high speed or invert the tube until the Igapol is in solution. Igapol may not easily mix with the blocking buffer. It may take multiple rounds of vortexing to fully mix the solution. Clumps of Igapol at the bottom of the conical tube or strands of of Igapol visible in the blocking buffer indicate more mixing is needed. If a centrifuge is available, the conical tube can be briefly centrifuged to eliminate bubbles and collect the grinding buffer at the bottom of the tube. If a centrifuge is not available, the solution can be placed in a refrigerator to rest for at least 30 minutes. This step will make it easier to avoid getting grinding buffer on the shaft of the pipette while dispensing. Label the tube using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the name of the solution, the contents, the date the solution was made, storage conditions, and the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the solution. Grinding buffer can be used immediately to prepare mosquitoes or can be stored at 4 degrees Celsius for one week. 50% glycerol is used to rehydrate lyophilized antibodies. Storing antibodies at minus 20 degrees Celsius that have been rehydrated in water can lead to damage from cycles of freezing and thawing every time the antibody is used. 50% glycerol does not freeze during storage at minus 20 degrees Celsius and helps to prevent this damage. The materials needed to prepare 10 milliliters of 50 
50% glycerol are deionized water, 100% glycerol, a 15 milliliter conical tube and conical tube holder for mixing the stock solution, a P1000 pipette and P1000 pipette tips to measure water and glycerol, scissors, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent under pad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. It is optional to use a vortex for mixing the solution. Place the conical tube in a conical tube holder. Loosen the cap. Set a P1000 pipette to 1000 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Using the pipette, measure 1000 microliters of deionized water. Remove the cap from the empty conical tube. Transfer the water to the empty tube. Repeat this four more more times for a total volume of 5 milliliters. If the pipette tip touches any surfaces, discard the pipette tip and attach a new one. Once 5 milliliters of water has been added to the tube, discard the pipette tip. Loosely place the cap over the tube. In the next step, 100% glycerol will be added. Concentrated glycerol is highly viscous, so techniques for pipetting viscous liquids should be used. Low retention, wide bore pipette tips can be used, but if these are not available, clean scissors can be used to cut off about one millimeter of a normal pipette tip. This will widen the opening, making it easier to aspirate the glycerol. Set a P1000 pipette to 1000 microliters and attach the pipette tip with the enlarged opening at the tip. A technique called reverse pipetting should be used for this step and can be used when pipetting any viscous liquids. Press the pipette plunger to the second stop before placing the tip into the glycerol. Holding the plunger at the second stop, put the pipette tip into the glycerol just below the surface. Release the plunger very slowly, making sure the pipette tip remains submerged until liquid stops being drawn up into the pipette tip. If large bubbles of air are drawn into the pipette tip, discard the pipette tip, place a new one on the pipette, and try again, releasing the plunger more slowly and leaving the pipette tip submerged in the liquid a little longer. Remove the cap from the tube containing deionized water. Remove the pipette tip from the glycerol. Gently touch the pipette tip to the inside of the container to remove any excess glycerol from the outside of the pipette tip. Move the pipette tip over the deionized water. The pipette shaft should remain fully outside of the bottle. Slowly press the plunger to the first stop only. Hold the plunger at the first stop until glycerol is no longer running out of the pipette tip. Do not press the plunger to the second stop. Discard the used pipette tip and any remaining glycerol on the tip into the discard bin. Repeat this five times. Use a new pipette tip for each addition of glycerol. Careful that the glycerol does not touch the base of the pipette shaft inside the pipette tip as it is being aspirated. If it appears as though this might happen, lower the volume setting of the pipette and repeat the reverse pipetting procedure with a new pipette tip each time until a total of 5,000 microliters have been added. Cap the conical tube. Vortex at medium to high speed or invert the tube until the glycerol is in solution. Label the tube using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the name of the solution, the date the solution was made, storage conditions, and the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the solution. 50% glycerol can be used immediately to rehydrate lyophilized antibodies or can be stored at four degrees Celsius. Monoclonal capture and detection antibodies and positive controls are shipped lyophilized or dried and at room temperature. Kits of CS ELISA antibodies and positive controls can be requested free of charge. More information on how to obtain antibody kits is available in the CS ELISA manual. The source and amount of antibodies and positive controls distributed in the kits is subject to change. It is important to use the protocol version enclosed with each kit and to be aware of the lot numbers on each vial. Following arrival, antibodies and positive controls should be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. The detection antibody is labeled with horseradish peroxidase, which is light sensitive. These vials should be stored in dark or foil-wrapped containers. Once rehydrated, antibodies and positive controls should be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. 
50% glycerol solution should be prepared before antibodies are rehydrated. For instructions on how to prepare the 50% glycerol solution, review the section Preparing 50% Glycerol. The materials needed for rehydrating antibodies are a vial or vials of lyophilized antibodies, 50% glycerol, a conical tube holder to hold the tube of 50% glycerol solution, a P1000 pipette and P1000 pipette tips to measure the 50% glycerol solution, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. The label on each vial of antibody will show the volume of 50% glycerol that is to be added. The resulting stock concentrations should be 0.5 milligrams per milliliter. Rehydration steps only need to be performed once, that is, when a new vial of antibody is being started. The process of rehydrating antibodies will be demonstrated using a new vial of PF capture antibody. The vial contains one milligram of lyophilized antibody. By adding the indicated two milliliters or 2,000 microliters of 50% glycerol, the rehydrated concentration of the antibody solution will be 0.5 milligrams per milliliter. Place the conical tube containing containing the 50% glycerol solution in a conical tube holder. Loosen the cap. Gently tap the vial of lyophilized antibody to collect the antibody powder at the bottom of the tube. Carefully uncap the vial. Place the cap to the side. Set a P1000 pipette to 1000 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Remove the cap from the 50% glycerol solution. Using the pipette, Transfer 1,000 microliters of 50% glycerol solution to the antibody vial. Discard the pipette tip, place the caps back on the tube of 50% glycerol solution and the antibody vial. Set the vial of antibody on the counter to rest for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, invert the vial of rehydrated antibody 15 to 20 times to mix. Label the vial using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the date the lyophilized antibody was received, the initials of the person who received the antibody, the date the lyophilized antibody was rehydrated, the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the antibody solution, and the contents of the antibody solution. The rehydrated antibody solution can be used immediately in the CS ELISA or stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. The 50% glycerol can be returned to storage at 4 degrees Celsius. Blocking buffer should be prepared before antibodies are rehydrated. For instructions on how to prepare blocking buffer, review the section Preparing Blocking Buffer. The materials needed for rehydrating positive controls are a tube or tubes of dried positive control blocking buffer, a P1000 pipette and P1000 pipette tips to measure the blocking buffer, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, and a fine point permanent marker. If blocking buffer is frozen, it should be moved to the fridge at least one day before being used to rehydrate positive controls. All positive controls should be rehydrated with 1,000 microliters of blocking buffer. The resulting stock concentration will vary for each positive control. Rehydration steps only need to be performed once, that is, when a new tube of positive control is being started. The process of rehydrating positive controls will be demonstrated using a new tube of PF positive control. The tube contains 0.1 micrograms of dried positive control. By adding the indicated 1,000 microliters of blocking buffer, the rehydrated concentration of the positive control solution will be 100 picograms per microliter. Loosen the cap on the bottle of blocking buffer. Gently tap the tube of dried positive control to collect the positive control powder at the bottom of the tube. Carefully uncap the tube and place the cap to the side. Set a P1000 pipette to 1000 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Remove the cap from the blocking buffer. Using the pipette, slowly transfer 1000 microliters of blocking buffer to the positive control tube. Discard the pipette tip. Secure the caps back on the bottle of blocking buffer and the positive control tube. Set the tube of positive control on the counter to rest 
for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, invert the tube of rehydrated positive control 15 to 20 times to mix. Label the tube using a permanent fine point marker in accordance to your laboratory guidelines. This can include the date the dried positive control was received, the initials of the person who received the positive control, the date the dried positive control was rehydrated, the initials of the laboratorian who prepared the positive control solution, and the contents of the positive control solution. The rehydrated positive control solution can be used immediately in the CS ELISA or stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. The blocking buffer can be returned to storage at 4 degrees Celsius. Several methods can be used to collect Anopheles mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are typically stored in order to preserve them for laboratory processing at a later time. As part of the study design process, before sample collection begins, a sample database should be developed and a labeling system and storage method should be determined. It should be kept in mind that storing one mosquito per tube is best and the mosquitoes will be divided into different parts for different purposes, such as PCR, blood meal analysis, and CS ELISA. If possible, printed barcodes and unique identifiers should be used. Labels that have been handwritten using permanent marker can be difficult to read, are subject to transcription error, and may smear or wipe off if ethanol is being used as a storage medium. CS protein can be present in the developing parasite oocysts dissolved in mosquito hemolymph and on sporozoites in the hemocyl or salivary glands. Dissecting and testing only the mosquito head and thorax aims to minimize false positive CS CS ELISA results caused by protein presence from areas other than the salivary glands. A positive CS ELISA does not establish a mosquito species as a vector. Results may not be synonymous with salivary gland sporozoite dissections. The CS ELISAs can be carried out on fresh, frozen, ethanol-preserved, or dried mosquitoes. Improper storage of mosquitoes prior to CS ELISA testing can cause microbial growth. Microbial growth can lead to high background in the assay. Following collection, mosquitoes should be stored, or in the case that fresh specimens are being used, processed as quickly as possible. Frozen specimens should be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius or colder. Ethanol-preserved specimens should be stored at 70% or higher ethanol at room temperature, or colder, and dried specimens should be stored on desiccant at room temperature or colder. Desiccant should be checked regularly and replaced as needed. Consideration should be given to the possibility of conducting other tests. For example, molecular assays and host blood meal ELISAs may require different storage conditions or extraction buffers. With regard to negative control mosquitoes, the head thorax of a known uninfected Anopheles female mosquito stored using the same method and for the same length of time as the collection mosquitoes is recommended. Negative control mosquitoes can be sourced from insectary reared colonies if available or larval collections that have been reared in the insectary to adults. If these sources are not options, the fresh head thorax of female mosquitoes or male mosquitoes can be used as negative controls. The materials needed to dissect mosquitoes are enough 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tubes in which to place the head thoraces that are to be dissected from collected and control mosquitoes, a minimum of two 96 place 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube tray, a scalpel, fine point forceps, lab tissues to wipe the scalpel blade, a fine point permanent marker, or pre-printed labels to label tubes containing newly dissected head thoraces, paper, lab tissues, or a filter paper disc, and a 100 millimeter petri dish lid to use as a dissecting surface, and CS ELISA plate layout templates. It is recommended, but optional, that dissections be conducted under a dissecting microscope. Plate layout templates should be created to include all samples to be processed by CS ELISA. Each assay plate should include a well, for example, 1A for positive control antigen, and seven wells, for example, 1BH for negative controls. The remaining wells are filled with samples. It is recommended that plate layouts be created and saved using a computer. A copy should be printed and kept in laboratory notebooks. The printed copy can be used to add notes about each assay plate during mosquito dissections and CS ELISA. This will help to avoid sample label transcription error and handwriting that may be difficult to read and creates a backup copy. Arrange mosquitoes in their original collection 
nine tubes in a 96 place 1.5 milliliter tube tray according to the plate layout template. Leave column one of the tray empty. Label a new 1.5 milliliter tube with the information that corresponds to the original tube in 2A. If possible, use pre-printed labels. Here we have used H-T to identify tubes containing the head thorax portion of samples. Place the empty tube with the cap closed in the corresponding spot in a new 96 place 1.5 milliliter tube tray. Using forceps, remove the mosquito from the original collection tube in 2A and place it onto the dissecting surface. The dissecting surface can be a clean lab tissue, a piece of paper, or a disc of filter paper placed in a petri dish. The latter is a good option, particularly if dissections will be done using a microscope. Using a clean scalpel, dissect the mosquito under the microscope at line A. This creates a dissection line across the thorax and between the second and third legs. Dissection posterior to line A, for example, at lines B or C, can lead to false positives. Using a microscope for dissections helps to identify the correct dissection point. With dried specimens, precise bisection can become difficult as specimens can become Riddle. Remove wings and legs from the head thorax portion. Place the head thorax into the new tube. Close the tube lid and place it back in spot 2A of the tray designated for head thorax samples. Legs and wings should be removed to minimize potential for detection of sporozoites that might be in the hemolymph of these body parts. Place the remaining body parts back in the original tube. Place the original tube back in the tube tray that it was taken from. The same scalpel can be reused. Check that the blade does not have any mosquito body parts left over before moving on to a new sample. If necessary, wipe the blade on a damp paper towel. Dissect the remaining samples following the same steps. Be careful that sample tubes remain arranged according to the plate layout template. Negative control mosquitoes should be dissected in the same way as sample mosquitoes. Once mosquitoes have been dissected, they need to be homogenized or ground. This will help to expose the circumsporozoite proteins that may be in the mosquito salivary glands. Exposing these proteins will allow them to interact with antibodies during the CS ELISA. Ground mosquito parts plus grinding buffer is called the homogenate. Mosquitoes should be ground at least one day before the assay is to be conducted. This will allow any solids in homogenate to settle to the bottom of the tube so they do not interfere with the CS ELISA. There are many methods for grinding mosquitoes. For example, pestles can be used by hand or with electric motors and many bead mill homogenizers are commercially available. Bead mill homogenizers can decrease grinding time but tend to be more expensive. Regardless of the method used, at the end of grinding there should be no discernible mosquito body parts and the sample volume should be 250 microliters in grinding buffer. We will show the most common methods of pestle grinding by hand and with a commercially available electric grinder. Mosquito head thoraces should be dissected and grinding buffer and PBS tween should be prepared before mosquitoes are ground. For instructions on how to dissect mosquitoes, review the section Mosquito Dissection, Negative Controls, and Samples. For instructions on how to prepare grinding buffer, review the section Preparing Grinding Buffer. For instructions on how to prepare PBS tween, review the section preparing PBS tween. The materials needed for grinding mosquitoes are trays containing the dissected head thorax portion of samples, a 1.5 milliliter tube holder to place sample tubes in during grinding, a P200 pipette and P200 pipette tips for measuring grinding buffer, two 100 milliliter beakers for holding solution to rinse the pestle, a 50 milliliter beaker to hold the grinding buffer, PBS tween, lab tissues, grinding buffer, two pestles, if it is available, an electric grinder, a container to discard laboratory waste, and an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills. Label the 50 milliliter beaker as grinding buffer and fill the beaker approximately halfway with grinding buffer. Set a P200 pipette to 50 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Using the pipette, transfer 50 microliters of grinding buffer to each tube containing a dissected mosquito, including tubes containing 
containing negative controls. Only one tube containing dissected mosquito should be open at a time. Close each tube lid after adding grinding buffer. The same pipette tip can be used to add grinding buffer to about 16 samples. The pipette tip should be discarded and replaced with a new tip anytime it comes into contact with a sample tube or other surface. Label one 100 milliliter beaker as PBS tween wash one. Label another as PBS tween wash two. Fill each beaker approximately three quarters of the way full with PBS tween. Set the P200 pipette to 200 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Set the pipette on a clean lab tissue, making sure the tip does not touch anything. Begin with the sample tube in 2A. Open the cap and using the pestle, grind the mosquito until there are no discernible body parts remaining. Place the tube containing the ground mosquito into a 1.5 milliliter tube holder and keep the cap open. Hold the pestle directly above the opening of the tube. Using the pipette, rinse 200 microliters of grinding buffer over the pestle, collecting the grinding buffer in the tube as it runs off the pestle. Place the pipette aside. Gently touch the pestle to the inside of the sample tube to collect as much blocking buffer as possible. Cap the sample tube and return it to the sample tray. If the pipette tip has not touched the pestle, sample tube, or any surfaces, it can be reused. If it has, discard the pipette tip. Rinse the pestle by swirling it into the PBS Tween Wash 1 beaker. Wipe it with a lab tissue. Repeat this step with the PBS Tween in the PBS Tween Wash 2 beaker. Using this method, grind the remaining samples and negative control mosquito head thoraces. Discard the PBS Tween Wash solutions, wash the beakers, and add new PBS Tween after every sample tray of mosquitoes has been ground. If the wash beakers begin to have mosquito parts floating in the PBS Tween before a tray of mosquitoes has been ground, replace the PBS Tween. Homogenate that will be tested within two days following grinding can be stored at four degrees Celsius. Homogenate that will be tested long longer than two days following grinding should be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius or colder. The following video will show the CS ELISA. The CS ELISA protocol should be reviewed in its entirety before proceeding to make sure all equipment, supplies, and reagents are on hand. There are many different types of equipment, supplies, and reagents that can be substituted for those that are shown in the protocol. When an item cannot be substituted for an alternative, this will also be discussed. In these instances, using an alternative may lead to inaccurate results. Catalog and vendor information for suggested equipment, supplies, and reagents can also be found in the CS ELISA manual. The CS ELISA involves many different pieces of equipment, supplies, and reagents. A clean and organized workstation will help to create a routine workflow. In turn, this will minimize opportunity for mistakes and optimize time management throughout the CS ELISA protocol. The equipment needed for conducting the CS ELISA protocol are a 96 well plate reader equipped with a 405 nanometer wavelength filter and, if it is needed to control the plate reader, a computer, a timer to keep track of incubation periods, and a serological pipette filler for accurately measuring 5 milliliters of solutions, a vacuum pump inline filter to protect the pump from liquid damage, 1 liter sidearm Erlenmeyer flask, 2 hole rubber stopper that fits the Erlenmeyer flask, 8 port manifold tubing and tubing connectors is recommended but optional for the removal of well contents from assay plates during wash steps. A variety of pipettes are required for accurately pipetting volumes between 10 and 1,000 microliters. A P20, P200, and P1000 single channel pipette is recommended as well as at least one P200 multi-channel pipette. It is optional to use a vortex to mix solutions. If available, a Statmatic plate washer, syringe plate washer, or automatic plate washer can be used to add blocking buffer and PBS tween to assay plates. If these pieces of equipment are not available, a multi-channel pipette can be used instead. The supplies needed for conducting the CS ELISA protocol are 15 milliliter conical tubes, 
50 milliliter conical tubes, and two to three conical tube holders for making working dilutions of solutions, reagent reservoirs, aluminum foil to protect assay plates from light during incubations, lab tissues, 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tubes and a tube holder, an empty 96 place 1.5 milliliter tube tray, serological pipettes for accurately measuring five milliliters of solutions, pipette tips compatible with pipettes for accurately measuring 10 to 1,000 microliters of solutions, a container to discard laboratory waste, an absorbent underpad to place over the work surface to catch any spills, a fine point permanent marker, and 96 well assay plates. While many different assay plates are available, only two are recommended for the CS ELISA, the CoStar 2797 polyvinyl chloride plate and the CoStar 3366 polystyrene plate. These should not be substituted for alternative plates. It is important that only lab tissues be used in the CS ELISA protocol. Fibers from paper towels have been associated with high background absorbance values from assay plates that they were used with. The reagents needed for conducting the CS ELISA protocol are 1X PBS, PBS tween, two component ABTS, rehydrated capture antibody, detection antibody, and positive control, and 70% or higher ethanol for cleaning the bottom of of assay plate wells before reading plates and blocking buffer. If blocking buffer is frozen, it should be moved to the fridge to thaw at least one day before performing the CS ELISA. Approximately 50 milliliters per assay plate is needed. Samples and negative controls prepared in grinding buffer will also be needed. They should be arranged in a 96 place 1.5 milliliter tube tray according to their CS ELISA plate layout template. If homogenate is frozen, the tray of samples should be moved to the refrigerator at the beginning of the CS ELISA. If the homogenate is not frozen, the tray of samples can be stored in the refrigerator until samples are added to the assay plate. Thorough removal of solutions and washing of assay plate wells throughout the CS ELISA procedure will contribute to the quality of the resulting data. Wash steps remove unbound antigen and antibody that may lead to high background values if not properly removed. There are many ways to perform wash steps, including automatic plate washers. The method used will depend on the equipment available. Two common methods of plate washing will be demonstrated. For the purpose of this protocol, we will show the vacuum method throughout. The recommended method for removing solutions from plates during wash steps is with a vacuum pump setup. An eight port manifold is used to simultaneously remove liquid from eight wells. The assay plate is then turned upside down and firmly banged on a lab tissue or absorbent underpad five times to remove residual liquid. A lab tissue is then used to wipe the edges of the plate. Alternatively, well contents can be emptied by inverting the assay plates over a sink. One firm shake will remove most of the liquid from the wells. The assay plate is then turned upside down and firmly banged on a lab tissue or absorbent underpad five times to remove residual liquid. A lab tissue is then used to wipe the edges of the plate. Liquid removal using the vacuum pump setup minimizes opportunity for contamination that may occur due to splashing when assay plate contents are emptied into a sink. Assay plates should only be held at the sides of the plates. Touching the bottoms of the wells should be avoided. Filling assay plates with reagents occurs in every step of the CS ELISA procedure. There are many ways to accomplish this, and with the correct equipment, this does not have to be a time-consuming process. When working with PBS tween and blocking buffer, accuracy and precision are not critical. For these steps, syringe plate washers or statmatic plate washers are recommended. Two plate washers are needed. One should be labeled for use with PBS tween only and the other for use with blocking buffer only. A syringe plate washer can be made by attaching a large syringe to an eight port manifold. Solutions are drawn up by holding the manifold in a solution and drawing the plunger up. The solution is quickly delivered into assay plate wells as the plunger is depressed. A statmatic plate washer kit can be purchased with all needed parts. Solutions are poured into a reagent reservoir and automatically drawn up as the plunger is released. Pressing the plunger down quickly delivers solutions into assay plate wells. Stoppers can be placed around the plunger that help to control the volume of liquid delivered to each well. Accuracy and precision is required when adding antibody solutions, samples, and ABTS solution to assay plate wells. For these steps, a multi-channel pipette is recommended. If one 
is not available, a single channel pipette can be used. Solutions are poured into a reagent reservoir. As pipette tips are attached to the pipette, they should be checked to make sure that they are evenly attached across the pipette. Solutions are drawn up from the reagent reservoir and delivered simultaneously into assay plate wells. Pipettes require practice and maintenance for proper use. If the liquid draw is consistently uneven, a seal may need to be replaced or pipettes may need to be calibrated or repaired. The most common method to analyze CS ELISA assay plates is using absorbance values generated by a plate reader. Many different plate readers are available. The manufacturer's guidelines should be referred to for initial setup and use. Plate readers used to read CS ELISA assay plates should be equipped with a 405 nanometer filter. It is suggested suggested that a plate reader be used for assay plate analysis. If no plate reader is available, visual analysis can be performed. This can be evaluated at the end of the 30-minute ABTS solution incubation or at a later time from a photograph of the assay plate. If a photograph is being taken, a light source, dark hood, and camera should be used to create an evenly lit background. It is important that the assay plate selected properly fits the 96 well plate reader holding tray. Many new plate readers have a feature that is designed to securely hold assay plates in place during reading. This can cause the flexible CoStar 2797 plate to warp and can lead to incorrect absorbance readings. In addition, some plate reader trays are slightly larger than others. This can cause assay plates to be incorrectly positioned in the tray, leading to incorrect absorbance readings. More information on this is available in the CS ELISA manual and should be reviewed before selecting a plate and plate reader. If the sample homogenate is frozen, move the tray of samples to the refrigerator. If the homogenate is not frozen, the tray of samples can be stored in the refrigerator until needed. Prepare a new assay plate by first checking the wells for damage. If damage is identified, avoid using the damaged wells or use a different plate. Label the assay plate using a permanent fine point marker with information such as the date, what antigen is being tested for, and the initials of the laboratorian performing the assay. Label reagent reservoirs and conical tubes for preparing solutions. These can be rinsed and reused 10 to 15 times for the same solution. One 15 millimeter conical tube for each solution should be labeled as follows, ABTS hyphen A, ABTS hyphen B, and one tube for each capture and detection antibody being used. For example, one tube each for PF capture antibody. PF detection antibody, PV210 capture antibody, PV210 detection antibody, PV247 capture antibody, and PV247 detection antibody. One 50 milliliter conical tube for ABTS solution should be labeled. One reagent reservoir for each solution should be labeled as follows. ABTS solution, PBS tween, blocking buffer, and one for each capture and detection antibody B being used. For example, one reagent reservoir each for PF capture antibody, PF detection antibody, PV210 capture antibody, PV210 detection antibody, PV247 capture antibody, and PV247 detection antibody. If statmatic plate washers are being used for PBS tween or blocking buffer, reagent reservoirs are not needed for these solutions. Carefully pour one 1x PBS from the stock container into a new 50 milliliter conical tube. Label the conical tube with the same information as the stock bottle. This step only needs to be performed when the 50 milliliter tube is empty. This aliquot will be used during the protocol to avoid contamination of the stock bottle. If contamination occurs, discard the conical tube and make a new aliquot. Store the aliquot at four degrees Celsius after use. Carefully pour blocking buffer from the stock bottle into a new 50 milliliter conical tube. Tube. Label the conical tube with the same information as the stock bottle. This step only needs to be performed when the 50 milliliter tube is empty. This aliquot will be used during the protocol to avoid contamination of the stock bottle. If contamination occurs, discard the conical tube and make a new aliquot. Store the aliquot at 4 degrees Celsius after use. The CS ELISA will be demonstrated using PF antibodies. 
The same steps should be followed when testing for PV10 and PV247. Remove the vial of stock capture antibody from the freezer. Record the lot number of the capture antibody vial on the plate layout for the samples being processed. The volumes used to make PV210 and PV247 capture antibody solutions are different from PF. Refer to the written protocol for dilution information. 5 milliliters of capture antibody solution is enough for one assay plate. Place the 50 milliliter conical tube containing 1x PBS and the empty 15 milliliter conical tube labeled PF capture antibody in tube holders. Loosen the caps of both tubes. Using a serological pipette and serological pipette filler, transfer 5 milliliters of 1x PBS to the tube labeled PF capture antibody. Cap the 1x PBS tube and set it aside. Discard the serological pipette. Uncap the vial of PF capture antibody and set the cap aside. Set the opened vial somewhere that it cannot be easily knocked over. Set a P200 pipette to 40 microliters. Attach a pipette tip. Using the pipette, transfer 40 microliters of PF capture antibody from the stock vial to the tube labeled PF capture antibody, containing 5 milliliters of 1x PBS. Discard the pipette tip. Cap the PF capture antibody vial and the PF capture antibody tube. Return the PF capture antibody vial to the freezer. Vortex the PF capture antibody tube at medium to high speed or invert the tube 15 to 20 times. Remove the cap from the PF capture antibody tube. Pour the contents into the reagent reservoir labeled PF capture antibody. Set a P200 single channel and P200 multi-channel pipette to 50 microliters. Attach pipette tips to the multi-channel pipette. Using the multi-channel pipette, transfer 50 microliters of PF capture antibody solution from the reagent reservoir to each of the wells on the assay plate. The same tips can be used throughout this step. The multi-channel pipette can become difficult to use if the solution is too shallow in the reagent reservoir. If this happens, attach a pipette tip to the single-channel pipette and use the single-channel pipette to fill the remaining wells from the reagent reservoir. Residual PF capture antibody solution in the conical tube can also be used to fill wells. Once all wells are filled, discard the pipette tips. Cover the assay plate with aluminum foil to seal out as much light as possible. Start a timer to 30 minutes. Rinse the reagent reservoir and conical tube with water and set them to dry. Begin preparation of the blocking buffer when there is about five minutes remaining in the capture antibody incubation. Pour approximately 40 milliliters of blocking buffer into a statmatic from the stock bottle. Place the 1.6 milliliter ring around the statmatic plunger. This will stop the plunger from being depressed after approximately 200 microliters of blocking buffer have been delivered through each port of the eight port manifold. To prime the statmatic, hold the eight port manifold over a sink or discard container. Depress and release the plunger until blocking buffer is ejected from the eight port manifold. If using a syringe filler or multi-channel pipette for this step, fill the reagent reservoir labeled blocking buffer. Return the stock bottle of blocking buffer to the fridge. When the capture antibody incubation has completed, carefully remove the foil cover from the assay plate. Set it aside. Remove the PF capture antibody solution from the plate. Holding the sides, bang the assay plate plate upside down five times on a lab tissue or absorbent underpad. Wipe the edges of the plate. Avoid touching the bottom of the assay plate. Fill the wells completely with blocking buffer. This will be approximately 200 microliters per well. If 200 microliters are not enough to fill the well, add additional blocking buffer as needed. Cover the assay plate with aluminum foil to seal out as much light as possible. Start a timer for 60 minutes. If it was used, rinse Rinse the reagent reservoir and set it to dry. The statmatic should be emptied of blocking buffer, cleaned, and set to dry unless it will be used again the same day. Leftover blocking buffer can be stored in a conical tube and used again as long as the blocking buffer does not appear cloudy. Cloudiness could indicate bacterial growth has occurred. Rinse the statmatic bottle with water. 
Fill the bottle with water and reassemble the Statmatic. Hold the 8-port manifold over a sink or discard container. Pump water through the Statmatic plunger assembly, tubing, and 8-port manifold by pumping the plunger 10 to 15 times. Disassemble and empty the Statmatic. Depress and release the pump until all of the water has been removed. Set the parts to dry. Begin preparation of the PF positive control working solution when there is about 30 minutes left in the blocking buffer incubation. Since the assay plate has been coated with PF capture antibody, this step will be demonstrated using PF positive control. The same steps should be followed when testing for PV210 and PV247. Remove the tube of PF stock positive control from the freezer. Place it in a tube rack to allow it to thaw. Record the lot number of the PF positive control lot tube on the plate layout for the samples being processed. The volumes used to make PF, PV210, and PV247 positive control working solutions are all the same. Refer to the written protocol for dilution information. 5 milliliters of detection antibody solution is enough for one assay plate. Label a 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube and place it in a tube rack. Open the cap. Place the 50 milliliter con tube containing blocking buffer into a tube holder. Loosen the cap. Set a P1000 pipette to 500 microliters. Attach a pipette tip. Use a pipette to transfer 500 microliters of blocking buffer to the empty 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube. Cap the blocking buffer and return it to the fridge. Vortex the stock PF positive control tube at medium to high speed or invert the tube 10 to 15 times to mix. Loosen Loosen the cap of the stock PF positive control tube. Set a P20 pipette to 10 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Use the pipette to transfer 10 microliters of thawed stock PF positive control to the 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube containing blocking buffer. Discard the pipette tip. Cap the stock PF positive control tube and the 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube containing the PF positive control working solution. Return the stock PF positive control tube to the freezer. Vortex the PF positive control working solution tube at medium to high speed or invert the tube 10 to 15 times to mix. Place the PF positive control working solution tube in the A1 space of the tray containing samples and negative controls in the fridge. When the blocking buffer incubation has completed, carefully remove the foil cover from the plate. Set it aside. Remove the blocking buffer from the plate. Holding the sides, bang the assay plate upside down five times on a lab tissue or absorbent underpad. Wipe the edges of the plate. Avoid touching the bottom of the assay plate. Remove the tray containing samples and controls from the fridge. Arrange it in the workspace with a full box of P200 pipette tips, an empty 96 place 1.5 milliliter tube rack, and the assay plate. Set a P200 pipette to 50 microliters. Attach a new pipette tip. Use the pipette to transfer for 50 microliters of PF positive control working solution, negative controls, and samples to the assay plate wells. Discard the pipette tip after every control or sample and attach a new one. Only one tube should be open at a time. Transferring tubes to the empty tray after they are loaded onto the assay plate and using pipette tips in the same order as the samples being added to the plate will help keep track of progress and prevent mistakes. This should be done carefully without distractions or interruptions. The pipette tip should be immersed no lower than about halfway into the homogenate. This is to avoid aspirating mosquito parts. These can clog the pipette tip and can also lead to incorrect absorbance readings if they are transferred to the assay plate. If mosquito parts become suspended in the homogenate, the tube can be quickly centrifuged to collect parts at the bottom of the tube. If a centrifuge is not available, wait 5 to 10 minutes to allow mosquito parts to settle to the bottom of the tube. Cover the assay plate with aluminum foil to seal out as much light as possible. Start a timer for two hours. Positive control working solution can be stored at four degrees Celsius for one week and used in subsequent assays. Negative controls and samples can be stored at four degrees Celsius if they will be used again within 24 hours. If they will not be used within 24 hours, they can be transferred to a storage box and kept at minus 20 degrees or colder. If PV210 and PV247 assays 
surveys are being performed on the same samples, it is recommended that these be done on the same or next day as the PF assay. Begin preparation of the PF detection antibody solution when there is about 30 minutes left in the sample incubation. Since the assay plate has been coated with PF capture antibody, this step will be demonstrated using PF detection antibody. The same steps should be followed if testing for PV210 and PV247. Remove the vial of PF detection antibody from the freezer. Record the lot number of the PF detection antibody vial on the plate layout for the samples being processed. The volumes used to make PF, PV210, and PV247 detection antibody working solutions are all the same. Refer to the written protocol for dilution information. 5 milliliters of detection antibody solution is enough for one assay plate. Place the 50 milliliter tube of blocking buffer and the empty 1.5 milliliter conical tube labeled PF detection antibody in a tube holder. Loosen the caps. Using a serological pipette and serological pipette filler, transfer 5 milliliters of blocking buffer to the PF detection antibody tube. Cap the blocking buffer tube and return it to storage at 4 degrees Celsius. Discard the serological pipette. Uncap the vial of PF detection antibody. Set the cap aside. Set the opened vial somewhere that it cannot be easily knocked over. Set a P20 pipette to 10 microliters and attach a pipette tip. Using the pipette, transfer 10 microliters of PF detection antibody from the stock vial to the tube labeled PF detection antibody that contains 5 milliliters of blocking buffer. Discard the pipette tip. Cap the PF detection antibody vial and the PF detection antibody tube. Return the PF detection antibody vial to the freezer. Vortex the PF detection antibody tube at medium to high speed or invert the tube 15 to 20 times. Wrap the PF detection antibody tube in aluminum foil. Place the tube in a tube holder. The ABTS solution will now be prepared. 10 milliliters of ABTS solution is enough for one assay plate. The ABTSA and ABTSB components that make up this solution cannot be combined before use. Care should be taken to make sure this does not accidentally happen. Remove the bottles of ABTSA and ABTSB from the fridge. Place the 15 milliliter conical tubes labeled ABTS-A and ABTS-B in a tube holder. Place the 50 milliliter conical tube labeled ABTS solution in a tube holder. Loosen the caps of the stock ABTSA bottle and the empty tube labeled ABTSA. Using a serial serological pipette and serological pipette filler, transfer 5 milliliters of ABTSA to the ABTSA tube. Discard the serological pipette. Cap the stock ABTSA bottle and the ABTSA tube. Return the stock ABTSA bottle to the fridge. Loosen the caps of the stock ABTSB bottle and the empty tube labeled ABTSB. Using a new serological pipette and serological pipette filler, transfer 5 5 milliliters of ABTSB to the ABTSB tube. Discard the serological pipette. Cap the ABTSB tube and the stock ABTSB bottle. Return the stock ABTSB bottle to the fridge. Loosen the caps of the ABTSA and ABTSB tubes. Loosen the cap of the 50 milliliter tube labeled ABTS solution. Combine the ABTSA and ABTSB by pouring them into the tube labeled ABTS solution. Cap the ABTSA, ABTSB, and ABTS solution tubes. Set aside the ABTSA and ABTSB. B tubes. Vortex the ABTS solution tube at medium to high speed or invert the tube 15 to 20 times. Wrap the ABTS solution in aluminum foil and place it into a tube holder. The enzyme activity will now be checked. The purpose of this step is to check that the ABTS and detection antibody solutions are working correctly. At the end of the assay, if the positive control well fails to develop color and the check enzyme activity has passed, this will indicate that the issue is likely not with the ABTS or detection antibody. Uncap a 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube and place it into a tube holder. Loosen the cap of the ABTS solution tube. Set a P200 pipette to one 
100 microliters and attach a pipette tip. Using the pipette, transfer 100 microliters of ABTS solution to the 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube. Discard the pipette tip. Cap the ABTS solution tube, place it in the fridge. Loosen the cap of the tube containing PF detection antibody. Set a P20 pipette to 10 microliters and attach a pipette tip. Using the pipette, transfer 10 microliters of PF detection antibody to the 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube containing 100 microliters of ABTS solution. Discard the pipette tip. Cap the centrifuge tube. Cap the tube containing containing PF detection antibody, place the tube containing PF detection antibody in the fridge. Vortex the centrifuge tube at medium to high speed or invert the tube 15 to 20 times. Place the centrifuge tube onto a white background. A blue-green color should rapidly develop. This indicates that the check enzyme step has passed. The tube can now be discarded. If no color develops, the ABTS solution and the detection antibody solution should be re made and the test steps should be performed again. If the test for enzyme activity continues to fail, new bottles of ABTSA, ABTSB, or a vial of detection antibody may be needed. Prepare the PBS tween for the wash steps by filling a Statmatic from the stock bottle. Place the 1.6 milliliter ring around the plunger. Prime the Statmatic. If using a syringe filler or multi-channel pipette for this step, fill the reagent reservoir labeled PBS tween. Return the stock bottle of PBS tween to the fridge. In the next step, homogenate can be discarded if CS ELISA testing is being done using only one set of antibodies. If PF, PV210, and PV247 are being tested for, samples can be transferred to another assay plate that has been incubated with capture antibody and blocking buffer. Samples can also be saved for reuse with antibodies of a different set at a later time. For this demonstration, homogenate will be discarded. More information on transferring and saving samples is available in the written manual. When the sample incubation has completed, carefully remove the foil cover from the assay. Set it aside. Remove the samples from the plate. Holding the sides, bang the assay plate upside down five times on a lab tissue or absorbent underpad. Wipe the edges of the plate. Avoid touching the bottom of the assay plate. Two washes will be performed. Fill the wells completely with PBS tween. This will be approximately 200 microliters per well. If 200 microliters is not enough to fill the well, add additional PBS tween as needed. Repeat this step. Remove the PF detection antibody solution from the fridge. Remove the cap from the PF detection antibody tube. Pour the contents into the reagent reservoir labeled PF detection antibody. Set a P200 single channel and P200 multi-channel pipette to 50 microliters. Attach pipette tips to the multi-channel pipette. Using the multi-channel and single pipette, transfer 50 microliters of PF detection antibody solution from the reagent reservoir to each of the wells of the assay plate. The same tips can be used throughout this step as long as they do not touch the assay plate. Residual PF detection antibody solution in the conical tube can also be used to fill wells. Once all wells are filled, discard the pipette tips. Cover the assay plate with aluminum foil to seal out as much light as possible. Start a timer for 60 minutes. Rinse the PF detection antibody reagent reservoir and conical tube with water and set them to dry. The PBS tween will be used again, so this does not need to be put away yet. When the detection antibody incubation has completed, carefully remove the foil cover from the plate. Set it aside. Remove the detection antibody solution from the plate. Holding the sides, bang the assay plate upside down five times on a lab tissue or absorbent underpad. Wipe the edges of the plate. Avoid touching the bottom of the assay plate. Three washes will be performed. Fill the wells completely with PBS tween. This will be approximately 200 microliters per well. If 200 microliters is not enough to fill the well, add additional PBS tween as needed. Repeat this step two times. Remove the ABTS solution from the fridge. Remove the cap from the ABTS solution tube. Pour the contents into the reagent reservoir labeled ABTS solution. Set a P200 single 
channel and P200 multi-channel pipette to 100 microliters. Attach pipette tips to the multi-channel pipette. Using the multi-channel and single pipette, transfer 100 microliters of ABTS solution from the reagent reservoir to each of the wells of the assay plate. The same tips can be used throughout this step as long as they do not touch the assay plate. Residual ABTS solution in the conical tube can also be used to fill wells. Once all wells are filled, discard the pipette tips. Cover the assay plate with aluminum foil to seal out as much light as possible. Start a timer to 30 minutes. Rinse the ABTS solution reagent reservoir and conical tube with water and set them to dry. PBS tween can be stored in the statmatic after the statmatic pump and tubing have been cleaned. Fill a small beaker with water. Place the aspiration tube in the beaker. Hold the eight port manifold over a sink or discard container. Pump water through the statmatic plunger assembly, tubing, and eight port manifold by pumping the plunger 10 to 15 times. Remove the aspiration tube from from the beaker and continue to depress and release the pump until all of the water has been removed. Reassemble the statmatic but do not prime the pump. Place it at 4 degrees Celsius. During the ABTS solution incubation, prepare the computer software and plate reader. Allow any time that may be needed for instrument warm-up and troubleshooting. It is important for plates to be read immediately following the 30-minute ABTS incubation. If a plate reader is not being used, prepare for visual analysis or photograph graphing with a light box setup. When the ABTS solution incubation has completed, carefully remove the foil cover from the plate. Set the foil aside. Use a lab tissue dampened with ethanol to carefully wipe and dry the bottom of the wells of the assay plate. Quickly and carefully inspect the wells of the plate for any marks at the bottom of the wells or for wells that may have been damaged. If there are marks on the outside of the wells, repeat the ethanol wipe step. If there is debris in the bottom of the wells, attempt to carefully remove it using a clean pipette tip. Make a note of any wells that may need to be rerun. Place the plate on the lab bench and carefully move the plate in small circles for about five seconds. This will ensure homogeneous color distribution in the wells. Some plate readers have a plate shake feature that can be used as long as it does not cause well contents to splash. If a plate reader is not being used, visually analyze the assay plate or take a photo. Place the plate in the plate reader carrier with well A1 at the top left of the plate reader tray. Make sure the plate is properly seated in the tray. Set the proper wavelength of 405 nanometers. Read the plate. Save the results in the plate reader software format. In addition, export the results and save them as an Excel or other common file. This will allow the results to be viewed on almost any computer. Each assay plate will require a separate analysis of absorbance values to determine the cutoff value. It is recommended that a cutoff value be calculated from the average absorbance values of the negative control mosquitoes multiplied by two. The method used to determine the cutoff value should be applied across all samples in a study. Absorbance values of samples above this calculated value are considered positive. Absorbance values of samples below this calculated value are considered negative. Homogenate determined to be positive during initial testing should be boiled and retested. It is recommended that initial testing be first completed for all samples in a study before conducting retesting. This will optimize time and use of consumables. Research has shown there is an association between mosquitoes that have blood fed on livestock and false positive results. Boiling of the CS ELISA homogenate is thought to destroy these nonspecific cross-reactive proteins, which appear to be unstable at high temperatures. The heat-stable CS protein is able to resist denaturation and remain intact for conformational testing. A 50 microliter aliquot of homogenate should be transferred to a new tube for boiling. It is recommended that a thermal cycler be used to incubate the aliquot of homogenate at 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. Other methods for heating include floating the tube in a beaker of boiling water or placing the tube in a water or dry bath set for 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. If these methods are used, the tube caps should be secured so they do not pop open 
during heating. This can be done using tube cap clamps or by wrapping parafilm around the tube cap. Tubes of homogenate should not be microwaved. It is recommended that the outer wells of the plate be left empty on assay plates used for retesting. This will eliminate the potential for false positives caused by edge effect. Edge effect is when wells around the edge of an assay plate show higher absorbance values than those on the interior that are not due to a true positive test. Edge effect does not occur on every plate. Fill out a new plate layout template. Assign wells B2 through G2, B3, and C3 as negative controls. Assign the remaining wells with samples that initially tested positive. Do not assign any contents to wells in columns 1 and 12 and rows A and H. Identify the centrifuge tubes containing samples that were identified as positive. These were determined to be in C4, C6, A11, and A12. If boiling water will be used, add water to a beaker. Boil it using a hot plate. If a wet bath or a dry bath will be used, set the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius. Label a new tube for negative control mosquito homogenate and place the uncapped empty tube in an empty 96 place 1.5 5 milliliter tube rack according to the template in spot C2. If a thermal cycler is being used for this step, use tubes that are compatible with the thermal cycler. Set a P200 pipette to 50 microliters. Attach a pipette tip. Use the pipette to transfer 50 microliters of homogenate from the original tube to the new tube in C2. Cap the tube. Discard the pipette tip. Avoid transferring mosquito parts from the bottom of the original tube. Only one set of tubes should be open at a time to prevent contamination. Repeat the process for the remaining negative controls and sample homogenate. If boiling water, a wet bath, or a dry bath will be used, secure the tube caps using tube cap clips or parafilm. If boiling water, a wet bath, or a dry bath will be used, make sure the temperature is at 100 degrees Celsius before adding tubes containing homogenate. Heat the samples for 10 minutes. If a centrifuge is available, tubes containing boiled homogenate can be quickly centrifuged to collect the liquid at the bottom of the tubes. Replace the tubes in the sample tray according to the retesting plate layout. Repeat the CS ELISA steps and perform the analysis as previously shown. Samples that are determined to be positive in the initial and retest CS ELISA are considered positive. Samples that are determined to be positive in the initial but negative in the retest CS ELISA are considered negative. Additional information and troubleshooting topics are available in the CS ELISA manual. Examples of topics are time and assay plate management strategies. If samples are to be assayed with PF, PV210, and PV247, a list of recommended supplies, and what to do if the positive control well does not develop color on an assay plate.